So in the last lecture on race, we ended with the idea of race as a social construct. And I wanna spend just a tiny bit more time on the science of race. Um, and suggest to you that, you know, research has revealed really no strong biological or genetic differences in the basis of the concept of race. And yet there continues to be a widespread belief in the existence of innate differences between racial groups. Now, as I said, this conceptual framework emerged from my perspective largely, and my perspective is built on the perspective of other scholars and largely in the 19th century, but its origin happens a little bit earlier than that. In, in the 1700s, um, so in the 18th century. And this comes from a Swedish taxonomist. Taxonomists are people who create taxonomies or ways of classifying things. And Linnaeus split humans into four subspecies, Americans, Europeans, Asians, and Africans. Um, so he gave these Latin names. He called them Americanus, Europeanus, um, Asiaticus, and Africa. And they said, and basically said that these deep, different groups were geographically constituted, constituted by different continents. So the first being the Americans, being the North and South Americans, and there Linnaeus was interested in the native populations of these places. So I think this is the 1700s. It's, it's some time ago. It's before there was massive migration and colonialization of this area, or just in the middle of that process, really. Then there's the Europeans who are from the European continent, there's the Asians who are from the Asian continent, which is huge, of course, and very diverse, and then the Africans. And Linnaeus was using kind of the classificatory schemas that he had used for other kinds of things, be that ge geological phenomenon or animal species or plant species, to think about subspecies of humans. And so in this idea, returning to biology, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, it's that within species there are even further subgroups or subclassifications that we can make. Now, the attempt by Linnaeus to categorize people into these subspecies was built upon by other scholars and as an attempt to sort of justify the idea of natural differences among existing racial and ethnic groups. These natural differences, which were seen in their, um, at the time it wasn't thought of as genetic because we didn't have a sense of genes, but uh, a sense of their an inherent quality of these groups, not a consequence of their culture and history, not a consequence of um, uh, uh, some range of impacts of economic development, but instead inherent to their very bodies and beings. And Galton, um, began to expand upon this and think about race within um, what we call a eugenics approach. Um, and this eugenics approach was an attempt to justify racial purity or to suggest that these different groups had different qualities and it was important to make sure that the qualities didn't mix with one. And um, uh, this, these different the, the push against the mixture of different racial and ethnic groups was in part to preserve, preserve some of the beneficial qualities that were imagined to be part of whiteness um, and not to dilute them or transform them with the properties of other ethnic um, and racial groups. And I should say simply here, racial groups. Now this eugenics impulse also um, was used to justify controlling or attempting to control the fertility of different kinds of populations. So in an earlier lecture, in a different lecture, I talked about Chinese migration to the United States and how such Chinese migration, particularly in the 19th century, was limited to men. Now part of this was an attempt to control the fertility and spread of Asian people in the United States, in part because a vision of race. That is, there was this view that we should limit the capacity of people from the Asian uh, um, subcategory of the species from coming into the United States because Asians were viewed as dangerous or in particular dangerous to whites or dangerous to the purity of whites. Today, there continue to be social movements and uh, social movement actors who seek to preserve the purity 
difference. And we don't need to think about this just in terms of Germany during World War II and their genocidal and um, impulses that led to the Holocaust, to the um, uh, murder and extermination of millions of Jews. Instead, we can think today to the contemporary period in time where racial purity is a part, very much a part of a range of white power movements, white power movements that have had a massive resurgence over the last four years, three and a half years, um, and where the drive the racial purity within that group is something that is incredibly strong. That said, when we get to our lectures on marriage and the family, we'll see also the ways in which more and more people are coupling across racial boundaries. And so we'll try and juxtapose this push for racial purity among some groups versus among others' view of this as unimportant, or something we need not really concern ourselves with. I want to spend some time talking about implicit and explicit bias, and then also talking about stereotypes and prejudice. These are critical concepts within the um, modern study of race and ethnicity. And implicit and explicit bias are particularly important because um, we require, in order to explain the functioning of race and ethnicity in a society, both an understanding of how it is that racism is something that people consciously or actively enact, as well as sometimes some things that people enact but without a conscious orientation to it. Now, why is this important? Why would we care about a distinction between the consciousness of people in terms of their willingness to enact racism or not? Well, you may, you know, I think for many of us, we think about it for a moment. If someone said to us, you're racist, or you're acting in a racist way, one of the first impulses might be to be defensive about this and to say, I'm not a racist. I am not a racist. I don't hold racist ideas. Da, da, da. And then a long justification for why it is that we're not racist. Now, that person could be wrong. That is, they could hold very strongly racist beliefs and simply not acknowledge them as such. But they could also, in some ways, be right, by which I mean that they're not explicitly racist, but they have a range of implicit biases relative to race and ethnicity that are important to uncover or discover. So this distinction between implicit and explicit bias can be applied to race and ethnicity, but it can also be applied to lots of other different kinds of categories. So you can think about it in terms of native-born people versus immigrants or you can think about it as the distinctions between men and women, and what are the explicit and implicit biases that people might have about these different groups. So implicit bias is the association our minds make between seemingly unrelated things. And explicit bias is prejudice that we are open and consciously aware. So I want to give you examples of implicit bias and even point you to some implicit bias tests so that you can understand how this might work. Implicit bias arises primarily through socialization, through socialization within families, neighborhoods, and school, and through media exposure. And we're continually exposed to stereotype scripts about different groups of people, and that begins to form in our mind a range of implicit biases. So what do implicit bias tests do? Well, a classic implicit bias test um, is one where you're asked to make associations between two different kinds of objects, and you see how quickly you make those associations. So um, you can search uh, online for implicit bias tests, and you can take them. And some of the most powerful explanations of implicit bias has come from psychologists who themselves work on implicit bias and have shown the results of their own implicit bias tests. So these are people who work in the areas of race and ethnicity, for example, are often themselves racial or ethnic minorities, and who show how even they have implicit biases against groups. And so um, myself, who likes, I think, I like to think of myself as a committed anti-racist, nonetheless have implicit biases against other groups 
And it's something that I have to work on and make sure that I'm, I try to be as conscious of as possible. In other words, I try to transform my implicit biases into explicit biases, which I then challenge or seek to transform. What these implicit bias tests do is they ask us to identify the relationship between two objects. So they might show us two images on, on uh, a screen. One image is a group of objects, say a book, a knife, a slide, a window, a lamp, and a desk. And then the other is a type of person. And they typically ask how quickly you can identify an object, given that you were just shown a type of person. And it's very interesting. In the US case, Americans are much quicker at being able, when looking at this collection of objects, the book, the desk, the lamp, the window, the knife, they're much quicker at identifying a knife when they've just seen a black person than when they've just seen a white person. Now, this is an example of an implicit bias in most instances, where there's nothing inherent about the relationship between blackness and knives. And yet many, many Americans have an implicit bias against black Americans in associating them with violence. And that this produces huge negative outcomes within the society, in part because of the ways in which Americans through um, uh, family and institutional um, socialization, in part because of the ways in which me the media present Black Americans, um, have a set of stereotypes that begin to be part of the ways in which they even think about Black people. By contrast, um, um, uh, 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 testers are much faster at identifying books when it comes to white people they're shown white people or when they're shown Asians. This again is like the association between two seemingly unrelated things, books and Asianness, knives and black people, is something that we make very quickly and that we're able, we enact with almost you know, a high degree of speed compared to other groups. And this suggests a kind of bias. So if when I talk about the experience of Black Americans, you immediately think about people living in cities, people who are poor. That would be an example of an implicit bias, a series of assumptions between two seemingly unrelated things. And I would say that they're actually somewhat related, so they're not unrelated, um, but that reflects a bias about one group versus another. Now, I want you to think for a moment about what your biases might be. And this doesn't have to be the relationship between race and ethnicity. It could be other kinds of biases. And ask yourself, what are the very fast associations that I have made about different groups? So you could think about gender biases. What are the very quick associations that you make in terms of women versus men? Or you could think about sexuality. When I say to you, like, imagine a gay man, what are the immediate things that sort of come into your mind and then you might ask how different agents of socialization, just to say family, school, peer networks, your friends, um, and media representations, help produce that orientation. And I would suggest that you all, as a kind of practice, begin to think about how it is that you might try and make your implicit biases more explicit to yourself and ask whether or not you want to challenge those implicit biases. Now, often such biases rest on stereotypes and prejudice. Stereotypes and prejudice tend to be two distinct things that we think about. Stereotypes are widely shared perceptions about the person, personal characteristics, tendencies, or abilities of individual members of a particular group. So stereotypes are widely shared perceptions about the personal characteristics, tendencies, or abilities of individual members of a particular group. There are all kinds of positive and negative stereotypes that exist for different racial and ethnic groups. Positive and negative stereotypes that can help some ethnic groups and harm other ethnic groups um, and racial groups. 
So Asians, for example, in the work of Jennifer Lee, one of my colleagues here at Columbia University, has showed the effect of positive stereotypes for school performance among Asian youth. That one of the stereotypes about Asian children in the United States is that they're very smart and school-oriented. And that teachers tend to have, have these stereotypes to expect high performances of those students and that those expectations in some ways produce the reality. They become what, what Robert called self-fulfilling prophecies. They, they, they became prophecies that made themselves real because teachers believed in the high performance of Asian students and therefore um, in some ways rewarded Asian students even more, gave them better grades or gave them more support because they expected them to do well. And so there can be very positive stereotypes about a group of people. There can also be very negative stereotypes about people. Negative stereotypes that can be harmful, that are based in a form of discrimination, um, racism, or um, some other thing. So um, an example of a negative stereotype could be, for example, the relationship between um, Jewish Americans and money and how they're oriented to money. This is a stereotype. It's a perception about the characteristics, the tendencies, or abilities of a particular kind of group of people. And that orientation can be used as a basis of discrimination or anti-Semitism. Um, uh, anti-Semitism being um, the ways in which people uh, uh, stand opposed to or against Jews as a group of people um, and judge them harshly and then sometimes enact violence upon them because of a range of stereotypes about them. So stereotypes um, uh, can serve to threaten the status, safety, security, and position of a group of people, of an ethnic group. Psychological theories help us explain why stereotypes and prejudices are so persistent. And one of the is that social contact can help mediate this. But I'm going to suggest that social contact is not always that effective in moderating the effect of stereotypes or prejudice. Prejudice, as opposed to stereotype, are the preconceived beliefs, attitudes, or opinions about members of another group. So whereas stereotypes are the widely perceive perceptions about the personal characteristics, tendencies, or abilities of individual members of a group. Prejudice are preconceived beliefs, attitudes, or opinions about members of another group. So stereotypes are more collectively constituted. Prejudices we can think of slightly as being much more individual. It's not that they're asocial, um, but that prejudice is something that I might have. And stereotypes tend to be things that we collectively share. Now, one theory of how to moderate stereotypes and prejudice is through social contact. The social contact hypothesis came from a scholar, Gordon Alcor, who suggested that interaction and exposure can be beneficial. That is, if you have interaction with and exposure to a group of people, it may reduce the overall levels of stereotype or prejudice that you have. One of the strongest examples of social con contact theory that is, having contact with another group and how that might reduce prejudice or stereotype is among the LGBTQ population. And one of the arguments as to why it is that the rights for gay, lesbian, queer, and trans-identified people in the United States has advanced so quickly is that with the major move of coming out, of being out as a person of this type, um, more and more people realize they had family members, friends, or other loved ones who were LGBTQ. They had knowing contact with the group. And insofar as they did, that contact moderated their prejudices and stereotypes. And so one of the things that social scientists think about is how it is that experiences of segregation, removal, or non-contact can augment or solidify both stereotypes and prejudice. So one of the reasons why some sociologists are so concerned about something like residential segregation or the ways in which different types of people live in different types of areas is that that kind of segregation can augment stereotypes and prejudice. 
So if you have residential segregation on the basis of class, where people from different income groups live together, you may have very negative outcomes because there isn't contact to challenge the stereotypes or prejudices that are likely to be consequent from that. But we should be cautious because in Alport's theory, it's not easy to just simply have contact and transform stereotypes and prejudice. Instead, he argued that there needed to be five things that would help moderate the impact of the stereotypes and prejudice. The first is the interaction has to occur in a collaborative, voluntary, and non-competitive space. So just having contact with someone isn't going to transform it if that contact isn't based in either collaboration, voluntary, or non-competitive orient, uh, interactions. For example, people may have um, uh, um, others from different racial and ethnic groups who work for them. So maybe um, you're an Asian American and you have a Hispanic American who works in your house as um, uh, 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 someone who cleans, for example, your house on a weekly basis. Alport would say that is not really social contact, which is going to reduce stereotypes because the interaction isn't collaborative, it isn't voluntary, and it isn't non-competitive. In this particular sense, it's not really collaborative. So you need collaborative, voluntary, non-competitive contact for, the, for social transformation of prejudices and stereotypes to work. The second is that this, the interaction has to happen multiple times. One-time contact isn't actually going to do much in order to transform these conditions. The third is that the contact has to be personal, informal, and one-on-one. -on -one. It can't be something where you're just co-present with someone of a different group and you don't connect with them in a one-on-one -on -one way. Instead, there has to be some kind of personal connection in, that's informal. It's not a forced interaction. The fourth is that the contact should be legal, according to Alport, and the fifth is that the setting needs to be one of presumed equality. It's another reason why uh, having somebody who works in your house for you for paid labor is unlikely to mitigate the experiences of stereotype and prejudice. Now, I will say two things about this. One, Alport's contract theory, contact theory about how contact can reduce prejudice is a very interesting and there's some empirical basis for it. But there's not a huge empirical basis for it. And we should be cautious that contact between groups isn't always going to be an effective remedy. In fact, sometimes contact, particularly when it's not egalitarian, when it's not based in equality, um, particularly with a setting where it's not voluntary and where it's not personal in terms of the kinds of connections that people have, that kind of social contact is unlikely to produce a transformation of conditions. So finally, the sociological approach to stereotypes is, and how to sort of mitigate it, is to look for data on behaviors or characteristics of different groups. It's important to just find evidence for how it is that different groups function and work in society. And don't simply accept that what we hear about them or what the media says about them is true. The second way to mitigate stereotypes is to be skeptical or suspicious of the idea that a stereotypical behavior or characteristic is natural or inherent to a specific group. Instead, one of the things that you might ask is how is that conceptualization constructed? What are the institutional or organizational dimensions for its construction? And why is it likely, not that that is inherently how someone is, but instead it's a likely outcome of some experiences of socialization. Third is to think of people as individuals instead of projecting stereotypes upon them. And through the fourth is to be aware of the consequences of stereotypes, of what it would mean to hold a stereotype against a particular kind of group. Now, one thing you might think of is like, can't we just treat everybody like individuals? And I'm gonna suggest that it would it may be ideal, maybe ideal, I'm not really sure that's true, to try and do that, but it's also deeply naive. But we as social human beings think in terms of categories um, and we almost always uh, navigate the world relative to an understanding of categories. And that while it may be ideal for us not to be able to do that, the world wouldn't be navigable 
without those categories. And I want you to return to a moment to the idea of implicit bias or the biases that we have that we're not even aware of. And I'm going to suggest that if you think to yourself that you just treat everyone like they're individuals, what that suggests to me is that you likely have a high degree of implicit bias, that is biases that you're not at all aware of, in part because you refuse to recognize the ways in which the world isn't really possible to navigate without categories. When you see a new person, you don't just think to yourself, oh my God, I wonder what that is, and then slowly but surely realize that it's another human being. Instead, you instantly categorize, them. you instantly say, that's clearly a human. And then some of the other categorizations that you make are, what is the gender of that person? What is their race? What is their nationhood? What is their age? You put them into categories almost instantaneously as a way of thinking. And that as you do that, implicit biases emerge almost immediately. So the first time you saw me, you made a series of assumptions about who I was, and that would be tied up with a range of historical experiences that you've had, influences that the media, family, and schooling, um, and your culture have had upon you. And that there were a series of implicit biases, some positive, some negative that you had about me that helped either support a range of stereotypes or reflected a range of prejudices that you might have. And I'm going to suggest that instead of being defensive about saying, I don't have those kinds of things, I don't actually experience um, stereotypes, I don't experience prejudice. Instead, you try to be reflexive about your own experience and ask, how do I do that? And how might I work on that in order to moderate that experience?